Hello, Spark fans, and welcome back to Advancing Spark, where today we are diving into the world of data science. Now, as you guys know, I am not a data scientist. I'm very much on the engineering side of things. And so once again, we'll be welcoming back our good friend Gary, who's going to give us the data science viewpoint. Now, we're going to dig into a thing called Feature Store today. Now, we've seen a load of different products come out with Feature Store. We've seen a DataRex product called Feature Store, but we're not going to have a look at the actual tool today. Today, I just want to kind of understand what one is. Where did it come from? What is this type of feature store? What does it mean? How do we understand what it actually is? If it's your first time around here, as always, don't forget to like and subscribe. Let us know down in the comments, are you currently using feature stores? Is this your first time coming across it? Or what do you think of the whole concept? Is it even useful? So say hello in the comments, but I think we need to go and introduce Gabby, who likely can tell us what they are. Hi, Gabby. Hi, Simon. How are hello, you doing? Hello. I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, but I'm excited to learn about the world of feature stores because it is a new and crazy concept. It is fairly new, yes, I'd agree, yes. So are you good to give us a bit of a history? Where did it come from? Where did the whole idea surface? Absolutely, Simon. I think I've sent some slides across to you. Yes, yes, um, I am glamorous assistant today, so I can <laughs> get the slides up for you. There we go. There we go. Now that, that's just a quick image to show um, the key milestones of Feature Stores. And as you can see, um, Feature Stores started back 2017 and 2018. Two major companies, Uber and Airbnb, who have popularized the term Feature Store. Um, and since then, as you can see, there's loads, been loads of companies, right? There's loads of small startups, um, some venture backed, and some uh, tech giants there as well. For example, like you mentioned, Databricks, Google, Alteryx, all coming out with Feature Store. I mean, so the list of names there, you know, your Ubers, your Airbnbs, the giant, giant tech companies. Is it kind of a thing that you only need if you are this giant, massive monster of a company? No, I don't. I don't think so. I think it's evolved. I mean, like I said, lots of small companies are coming up with it as a, as well as an as an option. Um, some open source ones as well. Some um, I think Tacton are is definitely open source. Uh, Fee, so are not on there as well. They're open source. So there's lots of open source uh, products as well around feature stores. Yeah, it makes sense. So what is a feature store? What is it? Uh, that's an interesting question. I've got a next slide, Simon. But be before I answer your question, Simon, I'm going to talk about features. So what are features, right? So features, uh, they're also called or also known as variables or attributes, and they define your data set, right? And features are used as input into your machine learning model where you tend to do a prediction. So if you've got a data set, like I've made up here on the screen, uh, and you, you wanted to do a prediction uh, and create a machine learning model to do just that, a feature could be uh, your column that says number of sales, okay? Um, and and to, to get the features into your machine learning model, it's just not you take it, get your data set and throw it into your machine learning model. You'd have to do your feature engineering process, which is, uh, in my opinion, the critical step in um, any data science or machine learning project. So what what, what do we would, would we do in terms of feature engineering? And there's lots of things that you would tend to do. But for this particular example here, you would, might you might want to augment weather to see you know how weather affects number of sales. If it's a um, an oil price driven uh, store, for example, you could augment that as an external data set. Yeah, that's that's, that's external augmentation. The other thing you tend to do is aggregation. So you'd have time window aggregation. For example, you have a seven day, 14 days, 30 days, and, and then you can go on and on and on. You could have store level aggregation, store city level aggregation. So all these come under feature engineering where you tend to do as a step before uh, developing your machine learning model. Cool. Oh. I mean, so those, those examples are largely numerical based right they're kind of like so for the kind of calculated numerical things is it largely that kind of thing or do you get categories and discrete categories exactly. and all that kind of stuff as well yeah the latter so awesome. and i think that describes your data that you might exactly. want to use exactly awesome okay so that kind of makes sense as what a feature is um nice one. why do I'm people getting, need i'm getting to, to i'm getting to answer your <laughs> question <laughs> so if you can go on to the next slide yeah. please uh, and, here I've got, <laughs> <laughs> and here I've got a slide just to explain the motivation behind feature stores, right? So you've got your raw data, and now you've got to do your feature engineering. And 
say for example you work in an organization that you've working with more than two data scientists maybe three four five data scientists and they're all tasked with the um, problem of trying to come up with a model using using the raw data so each of them would go away and they would come up with their own feature engineering and as you can imagine here now they're going to duplicate features because they, they wouldn't know you know for example say person one says, i'm going to do a star level aggregation and person two says yeah that's that's a good idea but does, doesn't quite realize that person one has already done it duplicates the features a feature engineering pipeline and develops the model Okay, so you're going to get this and you're going to get multiple models trained by several data scientists. And because your features are not in a common repository, they're not discoverable and shareable. As you can imagine, it's a time consuming process to do all this, the duplication of it. And it's not efficient. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I'm going to tie it back to, to what I know, right? So in the world of analytics and warehousing and all that kind of stuff, it's a common, common thing, the single version of the truth. You know, okay. So if you have three people all making a report that they give up to the board and they all define profit differently. They're not going to trust any data. They're going to go, well, why is it giving different answers? Why are we using it differently? The recommendations you make from those reports are going to be different because they've worked out the answer differently. So I guess it's the same kind of thing where if you're trying to define the same thing, number of sales, but actually they're each, they're rewriting the code themselves each time and they're, they're coming up with it from scratch each time. And it's not going to quite match up. Is that same kind of problem? Same kind, yeah, same kind of issue. So, you, you, you know, you could generate features in different ways. It, it tends to lead to errors. Uh, maybe you've got three perfect data scientists that talk to each other quite a bit and you can uh, totally avoid this problem. But the likelihood of it happening is slim, right? And even um, on a project that we worked for be before, we've had this issue where somebody comes in and does a store level aggregation. I think I then think, oh, it's a great level, a great idea to do a store level aggregation, and I just duplicate exactly what person A has done. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. And I guess you have the the management problem over time, right? If you, if they then if you make a business decision that we're going to change how we define that, if you've got it bits of code copied and pasted across all your different models, you need to go and update them all and keep them all in sync, and things can yeah. get out of. That kind exactly. of same kind of stuff. Well, so hopefully this gives you the motivation that you know having yeah. a common place now that you can um, discover features easily, you can share features. That's going to overcome this problem. But we still, I still haven't quite answered your question yet. Once you train, so what well, we're going to be getting there slowly. So once you train your model, you've got the next task, right, of deploying your model, which then takes us on to the next slide, please. Yeah, so the, the next the next step is, so say, say example here, model three is your best model that the organization is going to go with. You would then take this model and deploy it. And what happens is the, the same sort of feature engineering that has taken place in the training or modeling phase would have to be repeated yet again, because you've got to make sure you've, you the exact feature engineering that's done uh, in your training phase is duplicated. Right. So it's expecting a, a figure that's been calculated one way, and then when you try and score it, you give it a different calculation. It makes sense. It's not going to work properly. And if you don't do that, you're going to face a problem called online offline skew. Yeah, okay. where you've got performance mismatch from training your models using a particular feature and then using, a, well, having a performance um, difference from your model that you've deployed using totally different set of features so you've got to make sure your features are consistent so to do that sense. and the whole process of how you go about training the model is very different to how you go about then plugging it in and kind of doing daily scoring or real-time scoring or however you do it that so makes sense that they need to match up and be using the same logic the same code all that kind of stuff okay yeah um so if you go on to the next slide i think oh there we go. I've got a bit of an animation. So the feature, like I said before, the featureization process needs to be consistent to avoid your online offline skew. Um, and you, you don't really want performance mismatch, right? So hopefully now this gives you a good motivation to why we could do feature store. Right. So feature stores, they effectively a central centralized repository that stores curated features. So it allows features that's been created, uh, not only on the project that you're working on, it could be several different projects, um, discoverable, shareable, and it eliminates your online offline skew. So I think that's two real advantages of having feature stores. 
Okay, so what is the process? Is it, is it kind of um, whenever you've got a data scientist coming up with a new model, if they are doing any kind of feature engineering, they go, right, I want to make that reusable. And then they can put it into the feature store as a kind of part of their library of available exactly. features. Okay. Absolutely, yes. So that, that becomes immediately shareable, reusable. If you've got teams more than two, three, four data scientists, they know that their central repository, they can go and look up the features and think, ah, that's been done before. That's interesting. I'm going to use that for this model. Yeah, so if you and had one data scientist and they had one model, you wouldn't be getting that much benefit from it. Exactly. But as soon as you have multiple different people who could in interpret and understand things differently, or as soon as you've got the same feature used across a load of different models, that's where you can you start to get the benefits of it. Exactly. And if you're pushing machine learning um, out to deployment, again, you know, you're having consistency be between your model training and model inference, that's key to make sure you have you you, you don't have performance issues. Makes a lot of sense. Should be next slide. I think so. Yeah, the next slide ah, pretty much summarizes live or ML pipelines before and after feature store. So as you can see, hopefully it's just um, evident that it's a lot more efficient, a lot more cleaner, a lot more slick having a feature store. You have a centralized repository. You can share and, and use reuse features. You have consistency between your model training and model inference. So you know, it all it all looks pretty slick. Makes a lot of sense. It kind of seems it's like one of those things that's like a maturity and scale thing that's kind of approaching. You know, so when you're first starting out, you kind of you're not really hitting these problems, but as soon as you've got things in production, as soon as you're having to do like BAU kind of look after it for the long run, it's kind of the thing where if you invest a bit of time to get it actually implemented from the start, you're gonna just reap the you're not gonna Excellent. hit these same pitfalls that people have been hitting. Yeah, exactly. And, and we've hit the pitfalls as well, you know, so I can see it personally, um, a real benefit having feature stores. All right. No, that makes sense to me. So yeah. kind of, where, where, where do we see them? Kind of, uh, how does it fit in? Is it kind of just a, is it a separate tool? Is it a code repository? Kind of, uh, how do we start uh, using feature stores? That, that depends on how you intend to use feature stores. So you could you could hook up to your like your feast and tacton um, like applications. Uh, for example, I've played around with the feature store on Databricks quite a bit, which it it, it offers a similar uh, platform like your um, ML Flow, and and that's quite powerful, right? So you've got it as a tool within Databricks to use, which integrates into your ML Flow, and that becomes really powerful. So it's like a, something that fits into your kind of tool belt as a data scientist, part of like the MLOps process and baking into the whole development experience kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Cool. Well, thank you for uh, explaining all that and kind of just telling us why we need these things and kind of the problems that we're trying to solve. Uh, can I convince you to come back and do a demo of Databricks Feature Store and kind of take us through how you actually get started using it in a future video? Absolutely, Simon. I'd love to. Ah, I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for joining us once again. Uh, and kind of I'll wrap things up. All right. Cool. So that was kind of just a nice, light, easy overview of what a feature store is and why you might need one. And hopefully, if you're from a data science point of view, you might recognize some of those problems. You might have seen that kind of mismatch in terms of how people are defining features. You might have had the team change and people come in and have a slightly different interpretation of things. You might have had that online offline skew when you've actually deployed a model, you've given it to your data engineers and they've actually worked out those features differently. And so you end up with absolute skew in terms of the performance of the model. Makes a lot of sense, loads of problems in there. And yeah, in a future video, we'll have a look at how you actually get started using some feature store tools such as Databricks Feature Store and how that plugs into the rest of the ecosystem. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe. And again, It'd be really good to know what you think of feature stores. Are you already using it? Have you been using it for years? And it's like, well, yeah, it's just obvious. Of course we use it. Or is it a relatively new concept? So I'd be really interested to see how people are currently using it. And I'll catch you next time. Cheers.